welcome. In this video, I like to talk a bit about the implementation of role-playing games in formal education. I will here share some of the things that I've run into when working with EduLab in schools for over a decade. Some of the things I mentioned will be helpful also for non-formal educational settings or just role-playing games in general, but my starting point here is EduLab's informal education. And the first thing that sets formal education apart is that it is mandatory. Your players are not there because they are so into role-playing games. They are there because they have to. And that means you will probably have some students that don't like this. But it also means you need to figure out how to deal with giving them the possibility to opt out or not. What we usually did was to talk to the class teacher before to make sure to have a plan that they were on board with. We usually gave the students the possibility to opt out if they didn't like it. But, and here is a very important part, opting out did not mean that they could stay and watch. Opt out meant that they either uh, got to go and have a class uh, or a lecture together with another class, or they got to go home, but then got to do an assignment instead. This meant we could give the students a choice. Did they want to stay and participate or did they want to do the alternative task? Then this would also vary, of course, depending on the age of the student, the reason they wanted to opt out and what we had agreed on with the teacher before. Most teachers understand group dynamics and the need of planning for this before, both for the group and for the individual students. We will keep coming back to the mandatory part over and over in this presentation, since it has such large implications on how to run your role playing game in formal education. Let's start with some practical things. Accessibility. One area where it's very important about the mandatory part is accessibility. Of course, accessibility is always important, but when participation is mandatory, that means you need to make sure that all students have a chance to actually participate. And this is easier if you are the teacher of the group yourself, but this is not always the case. I have been in the situation where the municipality has ordered a lab from us that should be run for all students of the age of 14 in the whole municipality. Then I have no idea what the needs of the group are. Many times when having contact with the teachers, they will let us know before if there are any special needs in the group that we should try to accommodate for. But I have also been standing at the venue to see the students arrive and then find out that we have a student in a wheelchair and no one told us about it. For us, that meant we had to quickly tweak some of the workshops, uh, but the LARP in question was playable as it were. Another time we had a severely visually impaired student that had student assistant to accompany him throughout the day when all of a sudden that student assistant said that they would in no way participate in a LARP. We explained that they didn't really have to, they just had to put on one of the costumes like everyone else and a name tag and then they would just keep doing what they usually do and do their job. They were there to do their job and we wouldn't stop them from doing it. They then said that, nope, I have not signed up for this. And then they dumped the kid and left. That was very surprising for everyone. Us, the student, the other students and the teacher. But luckily this was a really awesome group of kids and they just stepped in and said that they would help their classmates so he could participate. And they did. And it became a great LARP for all the students. And my guess is that the student assistant's boss got a word or two from the teacher after. 
What is very common is to have students with neuropsychiatric disabilities. And how to handle this varies both depending on what disability they have and also depending on the individual student's needs. This is one of the times when I can allow a student to opt out and stay in the room because some students need to be able to step away for a little while and then they can opt in when they are ready. You still need to take into account how this will affect the group. You will need to weight the needs of the many towards the need of the few here and this varies depending on how the group works and how the individual works. Some of these students can also get very stressed by the fact that they don't know what is going to happen. And then it can be good to give them a chance to get an overview of what is going to happen like a day before and then get to see if it feels like this is something they want to participate in. Generally, I would say the guideline here is to talk to the student in question and their teacher and or assistant, uh, if they have one of those, to try to figure out what works best in that situation. I do like all students to get a chance to try it out. And I have seen teachers misjudge how their students will work in a LARP or role playing game setting. And most of the time in the direction that it works way better than they thought it would. This leads us to location because this will also affect opt-out. If you are in the student's own classroom, it's probably not that hard to solve a way to opt-out. If you are in a park or a forest close to the school in a safe neighborhood, it's usually doable if the kids are a bit older, but it gets more tricky if you are in a location far from the school or if the kids are very young. Then it might be necessary to have an extra adult there that knows the kids that can actually help out, either by stepping away with them, having them work on something else together, or following them back to school to another class. And this is why it's so important to talk to the teacher before. Location will also, of course, affect accessibility, and this needs to be thought about before, as I mentioned. Talking about inclusion and opt-out, another thing that becomes relevant here are props and costumes. When we ran our EduLARPs, we brought props and costumes to all the students. And this can really help with immersion and alibi. By just bringing some fabrics, some lights that can change colors and trinkets, you can quite quickly transform the student's standard classroom into something very different. It is easier to do something different if you don't wear ordinary clothes, so you don't feel like yourself and your fellow students also look very different. But this means that if you are bringing costumes, you have to make sure that they fit everyone. When working with kids, that means a lot of different sizes, especially at some ages where some of them are very, very tiny and childlike still in their bodies, while others have already hit puberty and are as big as adults. You do not want to body shame anyone, so make sure you have a large range of sizes and more costumes than you would need, so there are extras. You don't want to end up with someone not being able to fit into anything uh, because they are either too small or too large. It can be helpful to use clothes that are easier to fit, like maybe an open long vest, um, but you still need to have a range of sizes. And this also goes for props. One area where we had issues at the start, that was elf ears that for some reason only came in one color, some kind of yellowish beige. I mean, it's okay if the color is a bit off, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you need to have options and trying to buy makeup to fix them isn't really a good option over time. And in the end, we had to special order ears so we could have at least three different shades, shades ranging from fair to dark. Today, it is easier to find options for colors in latex props, but it's still not always great. 
when it comes to wearing props or costumes, sometimes you will have students that really don't want to or are uncomfortable or at some ages feel that they are a bit too cool. Usually I do not take a fight about this. I just say I would love for you to wear it, but you can wait around and we'll see how you feel. Just take a little while, think about it. And then you start with the kids who want to wear it because there are always a bunch who want to. And usually the need to be part of the group kind of solves the problem for you because when like 70% of them already are wearing it, it's not as comfortable being the only one standing on the side saying, I don't want it anymore. All of a sudden they will come and ask to get to wear one also. Um, and then it's just solved. So I usually try to not take a discussion at the start, I give it a chance to just solve itself. If it doesn't work out, then we can talk about it. And um, sometimes uh, when it's about like sensitivity issues or so on, I try to figure out other ways to solve it. Uh, maybe they can wear like in something open or something like small around their arm in a different color that they feel comfortable with. But that is a, a discussion you have to take on a case to case basis. But most of the time, just wait them out and it will solve itself. And one of my best tips for working with larger groups and costumes uh, is actually different types of headgear, like hats. Because it makes it quite easy to quickly see what group a participant belongs to. Because then you just have all of in this groups have like the Robin Hood look and all of this group will have high hats and all of this will have and so on. Also, hats today is something that most students don't really wear for everyday use. Of course, that depends on what type of hat you choose. I mean, if you take a standard cap with a cool, I don't know, text on it, maybe yes, but Otherwise, usually no, and that can actually help with the feeling that you are someone else and it's very easy to just take on and off. Just remember that head lies are a thing in schools, so make sure the students don't swap them around and that you don't use the hats for many groups in a row without leaving them for at least 24 hours in between. Oh, and remember, the more cool stuff you bring, the more time it takes to set it up, to gather all the stuff after, and it's more to carry. And when it comes to costumes, more laundry. Another practicality is about food. Do you need a lunch break? Hungry kids are not great players. Also, most hungry adults are also not great players, to be honest. Do the children have a specific time when they usually eat? Can they arrive late to the cafeteria or will that mess up the whole schedule for the school? In Sweden, we have free lunch for all school children in primary school with very specific hours. So if you want to change it, you need to contact the cafeteria in good time before. Or if you want a packed lunch, this needs to be informed in good time so the cafeteria can prep that for the group. In most countries uh, where you don't have this, maybe the parents can prep, then they also need to know about it. So you need to inform them before. And food and timing might also affect the planning of the actual role-playing game. You don't want a lunch break in the middle of a very intense scene, for example. So make sure you know what times you need to adapt to. And if you decide to have lunch in game, make sure that all the children eat because sometimes they are so into the game that they don't actually prioritize eating. So don't have very exciting, cool stuff going on while they're supposed to eat. Now we're getting into a bit more of the design parts. One thing I highly recommend is to have backup activities. And we talked about modular design in the previous course, 
and I get back a bit to it here, make sure to have extra activities that you can bring in if needed. And this also goes for having different types of activities depending on the player group. Different players have different player styles and like different things, so make sure you have prepped with both physical, mental and social challenges. For formal role-playing games in formal educational settings, I find that it can help to have a very clear and established magic circle. This really helps with alibi. I don't want the students to be unsure about if we're in-game or off-game. Have a very clear start and end and explain before how this will happen so the participants know. It can be a physical boundary. When we pass between those trees over there, we will start the game. Or a mental one. When I ask you, you will close your eyes and I will then count down from 10 to zero. When I have reached zero, you can open your eyes and the game has started. If you find it hard to keep your eyes closed, then just put your hands over them to help you. If you ask them to close their eyes uh, and do a counting version, I recommend that you close yours to show them that it is time, but then you open them again after just a few seconds. And then you can see if any of them have not closed their eyes. And then you can catch their eye and you can just silently gesture to them to close them. If you have only one room to be in, you can either work with a mental boundary like we just talked about, or you can do the workshops in the room and then when it's time to start, you just ask everyone to leave the room, gather them outside to give the final information and then you use the threshold into the room as the threshold into the magic circle. Talking about implementation also means talking about how to handle the group, about facilitation and game mastering. When running a role-playing game or workshop in a larger group, it can easily get pretty high energy and quite loud. Then it's good to have a way to take back attention and focus to you as the facilitator. And I personally, I don't like shouting at people both because it's not very nice to have someone shout at you and because it also can actually trigger people to start raising their voices to kind of outvoice you. Uh, and in, miss, in my case, it's also about saving my voice because I tend to use it in the wrong way sometimes and then I lose my voice. So what I usually do is that I have some kind of signal uh, that I use. Uh, so we use usually a closed fist that we put on top of our head, but you can have whatever signal you want, but it should be visible. So I instruct them that we will use a signal to be able to get your attention and get it quiet in the room, and it will be three steps. So if you see someone doing this, the first thing you do is that you become quiet, you stop talking. The second thing you do is that you copy it and do the same signal. And the third thing you do is that you look at the person that started doing the signal. It works really well. I usually have them practice this a couple of times. This is also works well because if you're standing with like your back towards it and talking to someone, if the person I'm talking to here all of a sudden put their hand up, I will see that, understand that something is going on behind me, turn around and join in. So usually I test them to see how fast they can do it, which is fun because I say, okay, start talking, be loud, which is super hilarious and fun because they're never allowed to do that. And then you do this and just see how it works, which is great. Also works great with adults. So I highly, highly recommend using this. So how to handle when students are dropping out of character? Well, 
it, we should start with thinking about why they drop out of character. And this can vary a bit also depending on the age of the student. Some young students drop in and out more freely uh, when they role play, like when they play make believe, they kind of just glide through it. But the most common reason for dropping out of character is that the player is unsure about what to do. What affordances do they have? Are we in game? But the solution most of the time is the same no matter what. Just stay in character yourself. If you just stay in character, they will slip right back into it most of the time. I've had situations where people started going off game, teenagers saying, oh, why are we doing this? When are we going to lunch? And I just stay in game and say, so you are here to do the most important test that will maybe decide the rest of your life and you are focused on lunch. Is that really where your focus should be? Where do you want to take this test? And I just don't break character. And that just pulls them magically back in. Then you also have this situation uh, that happens at a certain age. I would say it happens at least the ones I've met when they are around maybe eight or nine years old, when they want to assure you that they have understood the whole thing about play, that it's play pretend, it's not real. So you have this, you stand and you're like, okay, everyone, now we're going to go and see if we can talk to the witch over there. And then someone goes, but it's not a real witch, like not in the real world. And you go, no, but we will all pretend it is because it's more fun, right? Yeah. But it's not actually a real witch. And you're like, yes, we know. And then you have like eight of them in the same class having to just really do this. But just go with it. <laughs> it's where they're at. They're trying to learn what is make believe, what is real. It's important. Let them do it. Even if you get frustrated. <laughs> then we have negativity. When participants are showing a negative attitude, it's more common among teenagers, since that is usually the time when you are trying to figure out your identity and how society works. And testing boundaries is often part of that process. Another reason for showing this type of behavior can also be insecurity. The insecurity can be about what to do, about how to act, or just about belonging. So how can we handle this? Well, we can create alibi or using costumes can really help. And like we talked about, uh, staying in character ourselves and like letting the group do a lot of job for you. For example, with the costumes, just wait them out and it might solve itself. If this doesn't work, then talk to them alone. Here you will need some kind of meta technique. That is what we usually use. And the meta technique is about giving them information out of game. And this is both positive and negative feedback. So I would, for example, introduce it by saying, uh, when any one of us adults say, uh, I would like to talk to you alone, you will follow us no matter if it makes sense for your character or not. And that is because we might want to give you uh, a chance to play a really cool scene, but we don't want to spoil it for everyone else. So we want to ask you if you want to do it and give you a chance to, to do that. Um, but then it's important that we can get away from the others so they don't hear us. But you are allowed to use that when talking to us also. If you have something that is really important, that is off game and doesn't fit, that you need to ask us about or tell us about, please just come to us and say, I need to talk to you alone. Then it doesn't matter if we are playing the meanest character ever that don't care about anyone, we will just go with you. So it goes both ways and that is super important. So once they are informed about this, you can use this if someone is actually 
trying to break the game or mess it up for everyone else. Then you can go and say, I would like to talk to you a bit alone, and you go to the side to talk to them. What I usually do here is that I start out by giving them a chance. Uh, I tell them, like, I see that this might not be your thing. You don't seem to actually be playing right now. And that's okay. Like, you do not have to like this. It's fine. It, it's not for everyone. But I need you to try. If you feel that you can't try and that you really don't want to do this, then we can look at opt-out possibilities. Then we will talk to your teacher and you will get something else that you can do. You won't be able to stay around. Uh, you will get something else to do. And the reason I don't want them to stand around, which I usually do not tell them, is because many times if it is a high status teenager that feel insecure and they want to be really cool, one way to handle that insecurity is to hang around and then judge everyone else for doing it. And that isn't great for the group process. So therefore I do not let them do that. Um, another way to work with it can also be that if you have extra NPCs, for example, um, you have extra teachers that joined in or something, um, then you can use them so the, some of the kids get to tag, tag along with one of them. So they get a special, special position, like they are that person's assistant helping them with their task or something like that. Um, this can also work very well with more than one student. Like if you have a small group that needs extra support, they can be with one NPC in a smaller group so they can get more focus from an adult. Then we have the other way, how to handle the overenthusiasm that can happen. And this can be just as challenging as negativity. For example, when the group of students have solved all your prepped quests in like the first third of the game or when they take your game design and they start running in a totally different direction. And I mean, that can be fine. Uh, but if it's an edular, that might not be great. Um, and one way to handle this is to give them a focus. Usually I like to have them create gameplay for the other players. That can work really well. So, so they get in charge of coming up with like, maybe we should have a, a ritual. Can't you be in charge of it? And they have to bring everyone else in. And that is something they can focus on and get something to do. If they get really into it and just go in a different direction or like I've had the situation where one student like loved it stepped in and tried to like i'm the main character take a lot of focus because they really loved it i use the can i talk to you alone and then i talk to them uh, and i can tell them that i love that you're going for this i can see that you're really into it but unfortunately we don't have all the time in the world so we need to have the game go in a different direction so could I ask you to step back a little bit and maybe you can do this instead and then I give them another focus. And a lot of this can be handled in game, but then usually I like to have one of us or like an NPC that is high status, that has a character that the others will listen to because then they can in game enforce this. I do like to have a lot of low status characters um, to make the participants be the expert, but having one high status NPC can be strategic, especially in these types of edularps. If it is the whole group that is kind of super into it, but is a bit all over, then I usually try to work with focus exercises both before the game, but it can also be used in game. Um, so before the game, maybe we will 
close our eyes and uh, try to count to 10. But you are not allowed, if I say one, then the two people next to me in the circle are not allowed to say two. Someone else in the circle has to say it. And when someone said two, anyone can say three except the people next to them. And you keep going. And if it doesn't work, take a deep breath. And you start over. And that is really good to just focus the energy. So you can do stuff like that. Another thing that is important is group sorting and casting. So if we look at group sorting to start with, one way to do it is that you can just count like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Uh, that can be a good way to split in groups because they usually hang around next to their group. So if you do that, you split that up. You could also play a short game to have the same effect where they need to physically move around and spread out so they get split up. Or you can do some kind of exercise like line exercises and then combine that with counting to split them up. One thing I like to do is to actually ask the teacher to plan groups before because they usually know the group dynamic of that specific class so they know what kids can work really well together and where you might have some kids that trigger each other in a bad way so you don't end up with them in the same group and for them to have a bad experience. If we're going to talk a bit about casting, one way you can do it uh, when they're going to pick their characters is to just letting them choose which character do you want to play. The good thing is that they might feel safe because they get to pick whatever they want. But the bad thing is that if you have four characters and four people and everyone wants to play the same two characters, then you have a problem. Then you have to step in anyway and we'll have some that are not happy. Um, or if you let them solve it yourself, themselves, usually that means that some of them that are high status will get their will through and the others have to step back. If you instead decide and just give them out, well, you don't necessarily know the group, which means you might give them out very wrong. Also, they don't get to feel that they get to participate, which isn't great. And when doing this, you need to think about who should play what. I usually try to think about uh, if I have some characters that are more high status in the game, I like to give people a chance that feels like maybe they are not always the high status person in the class because the game might give them the alibi to do something way new. But you also don't want to give it to someone that actually are very uncomfortable being in that kind of position, that don't want to take the center stage and lead and just feel uncomfortable. Then, mm. So that is a balance uh, and not always easy. One way you can do this is also to work with different levels of participation. So you could say, we have some characters that are more, um, that will have more spotlight or that will need you to do more. If you are interested in a character like this, please raise your hand. And if they are, you give them one of those. And if they're not, you do not. Uh, so you could have, that doesn't have to do with status. Uh, but slightly more complex characters, for example. So you give them a choice of what level of participation they want to have. You could also work with just randomly mixing and giving out characters, for example. Uh, that can give new chances and it can in some ways feel fair for, for the participants, but it can also work out really bad if you're unlucky. 
Um, you could also do a fake random. I have done that at times where I know that I have some characters at the top that I think will be more high status and, and need a bit more work. And then I just pretend to not look, but I know where I have them and give them uh, to players. I think I can ha it will handle it and be comfortable with it. And that creates the feeling of fairness, but it actually lets you steer. Another way to work is also to let uh, the players partly create their own characters. That becomes kind of steering through design. So maybe they get uh, a character sheet where some things are decided, but they get to decide other things. And you have like, pick one thing you are scared of and you have a list of eight things. So they don't have the choice to say, I'm not scared of anything. Like, yes, you are. Everyone is scared of something. Now you have to pick. So that becomes a way of steering it, but still having them participate. On the other hand, it takes quite a lot of time. And sometimes it's not very common that you get a chance to do this, but you could have a questionnaire that you could send out before where they get to fill out what they're interested in, what they like and so on, and then use that. Um, it's usually not very doable in formal education, but it can work well. Um, yeah. Another thing that comes up in relation to this is kids wanting to swap characters. I want to swap with her. I usually do not let them. Of course, that depends on why they want to swap, but mm, it's very common. It's things like her character, uh, that sounds just like me. And my character is almost her, so we can swap. And then I can say, well, the point of this is to actually be someone else, to not be yourself. So then it seems like a bad idea to swap. So I would like for you to keep it. Or sometimes I'm just honest. If I let you swap, then everyone will swap, uh, want to swap, and everyone wants to read everyone's characters. And we don't have time for that. See if you can find something in this character that you can work with. Make it your own. And that usually works. To finish it off, I would like to mention a few things about the debrief. I usually do a de the debriefing in a circle so everyone can see each other and it makes it easier to do rounds. And when doing this, where you place yourself becomes relevant. Because what the first player answers if you do a round will color the answers of the group. I usually ask them how they are feeling in a round. So to say one word about how you are feeling right now. And this is not the same thing as what did you think about the game? But it's not uncommon that sometimes it turns into that while going around. So if you start around and the first answers are very positive, that will affect the group, just as if the answers are negative. So to steer the conversation, you can place yourself strategically next to some of the kids that you felt had a really good time. I also usually try to end with a question that will get a positive answer most of the time to make sure that we leave on a positive note. So I wouldn't end with a question about was there anything you found hard in the game? I will probably ask that, but I won't have it lost. One of the harder things when doing a debrief can be the teachers. You want them to be active and participate just like everyone else, but the teachers are used to being the leader and being on the side. And this becomes very visible when in a round asking, for example, what they thought about the day. Here, all the students usually answer based on their own experience, while the teacher instead answers something about the students. Very common is, I thought it was great to see how all of you immersed into your characters and really played along. That is actually more of a judgment of the students' performances rather than sharing about the experience they themselves had. 
you can work with this in how you ask the question, but also by asking the teacher to answer again with something from their own experience. I have also been asked that when you are running a debrief, do you things have to go in a certain order or can we like move back and forth? I would say follow the flow and feel the group. If you do a round, then you should stick to it until it's done. And if the group seems to zone out, then do an exercise where they get to move around to show their thoughts. Just make sure that you get all the parts you planned to go through in there when you do the debrief, then you can jump back and forth. When working with educational games in new groups, you will also have to adjust the level depending on the group. When I was out running a LARP uh, about norm criticism with all teenagers in a municipality, there was a huge difference in knowledge between the groups and here the socioeconomic factor weighs in a lot. When talking about how people uh, were sorted into different categories in the, the LARP, and that they were treated differently because of these categories, we asked them to think about examples where they could see this in our own world. One group brought up racism as an example, but they talked about it as something that happened in the US in the 50s and not something that is relevant anymore. And this is quite a clear example of how socioeconomic background can play in. They lived in a very white area and we then had to have the discussion at a level that they could follow and relate to. Another time, the first answer we got to the same question uh, where do we have any examples from our own world about separating people into groups and so on, was a student saying uh, my brother won Gay of the Year last year and was to be at a gala. When getting ready, he said he didn't want makeup and then everyone got super upset. Because he was gay, they stereotyped him as someone wanting to wear makeup. Just like we saw in the game where people were treated based on a stereotype. And we also had a lot of positive differentiation happening where minorities were treated differently, even if it was in a positive manner. They still got singled out and that happens a lot, I think. That was where we started out. And from there it went even deeper and the whole group had a very deep understanding of the subject. So there we could have a discussion at a university level. And both, both of these extremes or anything in between can happen and you will need to adjust to it when it happens right there and then. So uh, I hope you appreciate this and got something new uh, that you learn that you can use if you ever work with games in formal education. And thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.